Hello and welcome to our faculty spotlight interviews. These interviews are intended to provide our students and community members with the opportunity to get to know faculty and how their academic and career paths have led them to Mesa Community College. Today we are going to be speaking with Mark Yoshimura from the Administration of Justice Department. So welcome to our spotlight. If you could please introduce yourself and tell us about the classes that you're currently teaching. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Jess. I appreciate it. I'm a resident of the Administration of Justice Department. I've been there for about uh, nine years or so, and I teach uh, courses on introduction to criminal justice, ethics in the administration of justice, criminology, and the police function. Those are the four primary courses that I teach. Okay, very right, cool. So when you were growing up, did you always know that you wanted to be in the Justice Department? Uh, when I was in high school, I started to develop interest in policing, and that's where much of my background comes from. So as a 16 year old, I went on three ride alongs with the Phoenix Police Department oh, and it more or less confirmed that that's something that I was really interested in doing. So that's where my first interest in law enforcement came about. Uh, but when I was younger, before that, when I was in grade school, I had no clue, you know, as far as what I, what I wanted to do, where my interests were. I was just being a kid. So, but, you know, as I got into high school and I remember watching cop programs and one in particular called Adam 12 and, you know, talking about these two LAPD officers and it depicted them. I guess the best description would be they were stuffed shirts. You know, they were pretty <laughs> conventional, you know, the ties, the short haircuts and everything. And, uh -huh. but I admired them. I thought they were really cool because they always felt and dealt with different situations and had to make decisions on how to handle them. So that's kind of where my perception of policing came about. And that's, that developed my interest in it. Very cool, very cool. I'll have to check that out. Um, so where did you go to college and what was your major? Well, I first went to Phoenix College, and that uh, at that time I was majoring and got my AA degree in liberal arts mm -hmm. when they had a liberal arts program. And uh, those were tough years because I was a, a new father. I was 19, new, a new dad. I went to school full time and I worked full time. And you know, when I talk to my students, I can relate some of them have busy schedules like I used to, where sometimes I'd come off a a 16 hour shift ending at seven o'clock in the morning. And my first class started at 7.30 in the morning and I'd go oh through gosh. a noon time and finish with the PE class. And so those days were really a struggle for me. My GPA suffered, of course, you know, because of that, but I got through. And in a couple of years, I got my AA degree. Then I went to ASU and got my degree in sociology. Uh, by that time I was working for the city of Phoenix and they had tuition reimbursement which was great. So they paid for my college. And then while I was still with the city and with the police department, uh, mm -hmm. they offered a, an extension course from Northern Arizona University in vocational education. So mm -hmm. that was a master's program, master of arts in vocational education. And I went through that uh -huh. program in three years, I got my master's degree. And of course the city paid for that one too. So I was real yes. happy about that. Very nice. I know we always try to urge our students to look for different ways besides just scholarships to get your education paid for. Um, but yeah, that's great. So you kind of already answered this question, but did you go to college with the intention of getting the job that you have now? And then what other jobs led you to FCC? Uh, well, I, in, in some ways, I didn't have an idea of whether my degrees were, were where they were going to lead me. So my liberal arts was very generic, very general. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was for my AA degree. And then my sociology degree, obviously, that's pretty open-ended, too. It's not a very yeah. specific science or anything. And so it wasn't until I started my master's degree that I really had a, an intended purpose in mind at the end. And the reason why I got my master's degree in education was because I wanted to teach. And when I was with the police department, I started teaching as an adjunct uh, faculty member at South Mountain Community College. So I was already kind of in the education groove by that point. So everything kind of dovetailed uh, with my master's degree and what I was doing with my adjunct position at South Mountain Community College. Mm. 
So you provided us with some insight as to what sparked your interest in justice. Do you have a story or an experience that sparked your interest in teaching? Uh, for teaching, I think it's the fact that you can establish a professional relationship and share information that brings about these little aha moments, uh, bits and pieces of information that a person wasn't aware of or didn't know anything about it. And mm -hmm. I'd like to see that these bits and pieces of information help guide a person along to make the right decisions, to find mm -hmm. the right careers, to find the right degrees that they want to pursue. And, and so it's, it's a process really. And mm -hmm. so being an instructor or faculty member, uh, again, similar to policing, you make a lot of discretionary decisions. You're working in professional relationships with other human beings. And so you have to maximize what you're saying and what you're sharing in terms of the information and the philosophy that you're sharing with them to help guide mm -hmm. them along and make uh, great solid decisions for their lifetimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Do you have a favorite thing about being at MCC? Um, and do you have a favorite part about working with our students? Well, I think the biggest thing that I enjoy not that it didn't happen when I taught earlier at Mesa or at South Mountain Community College, but I enjoy the diversity of our students. And what I've noticed over the last uh, nine or 10 years and more so when I was with uh, South Mountain was that it's becoming groups of students coming in are more and more diverse. And uh, they have different dev backgrounds, different goals, different uh, dreams that they wanna pursue. And I enjoy working with the students and helping them find their passion and find what it is that they want to achieve with their educational goals, as well as their professional goals. So I really enjoy, especially the face-to-face -face meetings and classes, as opposed to what we have right now with the online you know, modality that we're, we're dealing with right now. Yeah, and it's great to have faculty spotlights like this, so that way we can create that connection. Um, exactly. And that way students can get to know a little bit more about the background that you bring, um, especially when you were going to school and you were working full time, you were a new dad. Um, so that way they can relate to someone and, and know that their teacher kind of understands where they're coming from. Um, exactly. So exactly. Um, and, you know, a lot of our students, they face different challenges from when mm -hmm. I went to, to college. Yeah. You know, there are financial pressures, emotional pressures, yeah. family mm -hmm. issues. Uh, physical, uh, you know, medical issues and so forth. And it seems as though, you know, they are magnified nowadays where yeah, everybody, yeah. every humanoid, I think, has a certain level of baggage that they carry with them. And it seems like they're the variety of issues that students are dealing with are endless. And so yeah. my job, not that I take on the role of being a social worker or change hats, but I try to supply them with resources that'll make their journey a little bit easier and a little mm -hmm. simpler for them. Yeah, yeah, and that's my favorite part about MCC as well is that we work so hard to provide so many different resources for so many different types of students that we work with. And then when we have faculty members that help bring that bridge of the, the resources needed to the students, it's super, super helpful. Right, exactly. Uh, do you have a most challenging part of your position? I think uh, one of the most challenging is, is right now, for example, we are in remote learning and that is a huge challenge because you don't get the face-to-face -face contact, the, the effectiveness of communication isn't there. Uh, students become rather anonymous in the online formats and so uh, the hardest part for me is making sure that I share information and make myself available to students that they can contact me if they have questions or concerns or issues. And uh, it's a lot easier in face to face because they can just, you know, tap my shoulder at the end of the class and say, hey, you know, can we talk about this? Talk about that. Yeah. But in this online format, um, you know, you lose that face to face communication ability. Mm -hmm. And even though they can communicate with me by phone or email or whatever, uh, yeah. it's still not quite the same, right? There's this barrier that pr produces some hesitancy for students to contact the instructor. And yeah. so that's, that's the biggest challenge that I see right now that's going on. 
Yeah. Has this challenge uh, ushered you to develop any new like ways of reaching out to students, developing anything new so that way students are um, feel more accessible to you? Just for example, we uh, we in career services have completely made all of our services available virtually, which is something that will carry with us when we're back on campus. Um, have you developed anything new? Well, what I try to do in my weekly announcements, I always mm -hmm. end my announcements with a comment about if you have any questions, if you have any problems, or if you didn't understand something, ask, yeah. let me know. And so yeah. I try to reinforce that with my students that I, well, I want to be open to their questions or if they're confused yeah. about something, an assignment mm -hmm. or something I talk about in, a, in a weekly announcements uh, to ask, to let me know. Yeah. And so I try yeah. to encourage them to keep that line of communication open. Yeah, yeah, which is such a great open door policy, um, considering a virtual environment. Uh, I, I know me as a student, knowing that my teacher is urging us to reach out to them, I would feel much more comfortable working with that teacher, especially if a challenge were to arise. So that's awesome. Right, and some awesome. students may look at my announcement and say, well, Sherry says that, you know, I should contact him, <laughs> but does he really want me to contact yeah. him? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those yeah. Types of things happen. And I'm sure that when they contact you and then they get that response from you, then they're like, oh, yeah, he really meant it. Yeah. Um, so when you're not wearing your teacher hat, uh, what do you like to do in your free time? Well, most of my time is either outdoors or, you know, being uh, a dad, basically. I've got one one son currently in college and the others in high school. So a lot of my time is in the fatherly duties and so forth. <laughs> But on my own personal time, I like outdoor fishing and hunting and, and just enjoying the weather here in Arizona as opposed to any other state in, in our nation. So I try to get out as much as possible. Very cool. Do you have a favorite location of where you like to fish or hunt? Um, I like the Flagstaff area for fishing the White Mountains, uh, the Muggy on Rim, uh, mm. for hunting and going up north to enjoy the weather. I like Flagstaff in the area. Uh, mm -hmm. North of Flagstaff, there, the Grand Canyon, all the way down to Flagstaff. Those are my favorite areas. Yeah, very nice. Um, so, when you are teaching, do you have a favorite course to teach? Uh, I would say that the either the criminology course, uh, and or the ethics in the administration of justice. Mm -hmm. uh, I say criminology because. If you can begin to understand the reasons and the causes of deviant behavior and unlawful behavior, you can start to work on the prevention of those things, of mm -hmm. those types of behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, I like teaching the ethics course because it opens up your mind to different perspectives, different attitudes about the rightfulness and wrongfulness of things that people do. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the decision making process tools to make the best decision, uh, not only, you know, in the course format, but in life, you know, how do you come to the best decision uh, ethically mm -hmm. uh, and what's the process involved? And no one teaches that. And sometimes mm -hmm. in my ethics course, it's the first time that people have ever uh, understood what the decision making skills involved uh, are and how they come to help a person develop the right course of action under any circumstance. Mm -hmm. So those mm -hmm. two, the, the criminology and the ethics courses are my, probably my favorite ones to teach. I also enjoyed mm -hmm. the intro course because everyone comes in with a clean slate about the criminal justice system. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people aren't familiar with the connection between the police, courts, and corrections. So mm -hmm. it's nice to kind of give students a foundation of understanding about just what criminal justice is about. Because if they understand the foundation and have a strong foundation, then the rest is a piece of cake. It's a lot easier for them. Yeah, I can't help but think that there may be a connection in understanding deviant behavior. Did did that understanding in all of your studies carry into you being a dad and working with your your sons? Uh, to some degree, you know, yeah. I think. Behaviorally, there are some principles as a parent that are good mm -hmm. to to know. You know yeah. the needs, childhood. Uh, you know trauma is one of the most severe uh, causes of errant behavior later on down the road. And mm -hmm. so, as a parent or a father, you have to keep in mind that whatever you do, your role as a parent 
is molding their future behavior. And so if you are very aware of what you're doing as a parent, how you're disciplining your child, how you're communicating with him or her, uh, how you're providing, you know, the, as Maslow would say, the, the basic needs that they have to have, yeah. I think it's, it's kind of gives you a better idea as to how you're going to lead them through this complex life that they have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any information you'd like to share with our students who might be thinking about enrolling in one of your classes? Well, I think if, if a student, <coughs> excuse me, if a student is interested in entering the criminal justice system, uh, examine it, find out what components there are in the system itself. Find out what the qualifiers are, what these jobs actually entail. Mm -hmm. Most jobs in the criminal justice system require clean backgrounds. You may take a polygraph test for some positions and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to kind of research different jobs in the criminal justice system and find out, number one, what they are about, what they entail. And more importantly, is this something that I want to do? Uh, if you get into the courses at MCC that we offer, mm -hmm. it may or may not confirm your, your belief system about what these jobs entail. Mm -hmm. And if you find out that maybe this isn't for you, that's fine. Maybe find another department with different classes or find another career track. My best mm -hmm. advice I've ever given to students is to find your passion. Find what it is you would love to do because if you find your passion in your job, it's no longer work and you won't have to work a day the rest of your life. Yeah. So I, I, that's how I viewed my police job. Uh, mm -hmm. I looked forward to going to work every day. I came to work early every day because I didn't want to miss out on anything. I wanted to be ready to go. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a student, I really urge you to explore contact career services, your, yeah. your uh, department, so that you can kind of find out what you don't know. You know, the old saying, you don't know what you don't know. So if you mm -hmm. can see what jobs are involved in the criminal justice system, you may mm -hmm. decide, okay, that's not for me. Or you may decide, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. And I know mm -hmm. that this is what I need to do to pursue my education, to qualify myself for that job. And so yeah. that's, you know, that's what I try to emphasize with students. Find what it is that you would love to do for your work, for your career, for the rest mm -hmm. of your life. Yeah, and that's exactly what we say in career services as well. We want our students to find their passions. And then when we are faced with a student who really doesn't know what to do, uh, we will often tell them to one, do some research and get that knowledge so you know more, but then also get experience, right? So take classes like you were mentioning to see if you like it, but then do uh, volunteering or internships or get an entry level job to see if the environment is something that you like and then um, simply by putting yourself in an environment opens up so many doors by the number of people that you interact with or the opportunities that present themselves exactly. to you when you're in the environment. So it really is just experiencing. Um, so right. we, exactly. You really yeah. do have to. Oh, I was going to say, you really have to throw yourself out there. Exactly. And maybe if you wind up in a job, even if it's a, a part time job. It may be a catalyst to or a connection to another job exactly. that seems more interesting or maybe mm -hmm. more uh, to your taste than to your liking. So, you know, mm -hmm. you just have to kind of explore things and be out there and stay engaged. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of advice that we got from um, Lo Dr. Lori Burkwam when she mentioned um, kind of addressing students who don't know what they want to do. And she's like, well, I'm. I am at my age and I still don't know what I want to do. But what I did was I, I allowed myself to accept every new open door and here I am happier than ever and I'm still open to new opportunities. So um, it's, it's great that we have faculty and um, everyone to look up to, especially when we feel so lost. So it's great. Right. Um, and I want to make a pitch mm -hmm. for law enforcement. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. I never, there's no other career on the planet where you have so much diversity in the assignments and the duties that you have. So for mm -hmm. example, when I got into policing, uh, I never dreamed that I would be gaining experience in training uh, mm -hmm. or in budgeting or in uh, program management and so forth. 
And mm -hmm. once you get into one of the, if you work for a large agency, there are many, many bureaus, many, many different types of jobs, whether it's computers, whether it's personnel, whether mm -hmm. it's technical types of jobs or uh, social service types of positions, but they are a catalyst to prepare you for your next career. And I want students to understand, you probably won't have one career in your lifetime. You're gonna have multiple careers. And so you finish one career, you may qualify yourself in your first career for your second career. What I did was I wanted teaching to be my second career. And I did that, as I mentioned, by getting my master's degree in education, uh, mm -hmm. by teaching as an adjunct at South Mountain. That prepared mm -hmm. me for a full-time faculty position here at Mesa. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was all by plan. I had intentions of doing that. So if you get into a large organization in the criminal justice system, use that organization to help you develop your skill sets for your second career. Because mm -hmm. in today's economy, the reality is you don't just get a job, retire, and live on your retirement. You know, most people have to uh, have a second career or second pension to make ends mm -hmm. meet. So plan for that. In today's uh, you know financial situations, you really have to have you know a long-term 10-year, 20-year, 30-year plan for where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so you've kind of already talked about your teaching style, but how would you describe your teaching style? I, I view my teaching as a series of professional relationships. Yeah. Each student that I have, I have to have some semblance of a communicate level of communication and a relationship. Now, some, especially in our online format, like we talked about before, it's a rather distant relationship, and in some cases, almost an anonymous relationship. But really, what it amounts to is, is my style. I, I'd like to see it in this relationship format where uh, I'm providing information or opportunities to discuss concepts and ideas. Uh, I want you to kind of rattle in your mind what you think about video what you think about this discussion topic and share it with others so that there's collective learning uh, that goes on in my, my classrooms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want students to, uh, you know, participate with each other mm -hmm. and share their relationship with the other students in these discussions. And when we're back to the classroom and face-to-face -face group work so that, mm -hmm. you know, we can all learn together in this process. So, for me, uh, education is kind of a holistic process where mm -hmm. it just doesn't be becoming a talking head in front of the class uh, yeah. or on a, a video. It has to do with, okay, what, what are we experiencing in this education student relationship mm -hmm. that uh, is the most effective process by which a student can learn and understand these concepts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you have any advice for current or future MCC students who may be thinking about majoring in the area of administration of justice? Um, and can you speak to a few more uh, career options that you can explore by majoring in this area? One of the things I'd like students to keep in mind is that some criminal justice positions do require a polygraph and a background mm -hmm. investigation yeah. and so forth. And uh, I'll give you an example of one thing that came up one time that, you know, was unfortunate for one person. Uh, when I worked in police personnel, I had a candidate who in his past had completed a four year degree in law enforcement. It was a bachelor's degree in law enforcement from a state university. And but he had a history of using a lot of different drugs. He was more familiar with drugs than some scientists in the lab, I think. But I had to explain to him that not only will we not hire him, but we could not hire him for a police position because of the extensive use of drugs and narcotics. Mm -hmm. and no one had stopped to tell him that, to have him look at the Arizona Post, which is Arizona Peace Officer Standards and Training, the rules that stipulate what you can do and can't do in terms of the uh, hiring process, what types of background requirements that there are. So yeah. I want students to keep in mind as they get into criminal justice positions, uh, whether it's as a judge or an attorney or a police officer, that there are background standards that you should look at, look at and kind of explore. And I encourage students to contact me and ask me 
you know, what some of these requirements are. They're very specific in Arizona mm -hmm. Post rules. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other jobs, though, that you asked about in the criminal justice system, yeah. in each of the three cogs of the justice process, police, courts, and corrections, in policing, for example, you not only, not only have police officers, but you also have uh, crime analysts, you have forensic investigators, you have computer science people, you have a lot of different jobs within law enforcement in policing. And that, again, mm -hmm. that's one of the beauties that I found about policing. There's just so much diversity in what you can do. Uh, in the courts, you know, you might become an, an attorney, a defense attorney, prosecutor, you might become a bailiff, a court clerk, judge. Uh, there are, I used to work for Phoenix Municipal Court, and uh, there are a lot of different functions in that court process. There are a lot of uh, technology people in there, uh, programmers and people who, you know, oversee, think about this, you write a citation if you're an officer, well, who keeps track of where that citation goes? All the court dates that that person has, the, the rulings or the decisions by the court on the outcome or the disposition of that case. Mm -hmm. There has to be a program, a program that monitors all that and tracks all that information accurately. So those are some of the examples of in the court process. In corrections, you might be involved as a correctional officer or a community correctional officer, surveillance officer, or prison warden, an administrator mm -hmm. in the correction system, or you might be providing services as a vendor, whether it's uh, mental health services, medical services, and so forth. So mm -hmm. the three uh, cogs of the criminal justice system have a myriad of different types of job opportunities, which I'm sure career services probably has a bank of those types of jobs mm -hmm. uh, in the justice process. So I encourage yeah. students to, again, use the resources that you folks have or mm -hmm. come to me and ask me about it, and I'll, I'll tell you the straight boop about that. You know, what these jobs entail, what are some of the pros, some of the cons, you know, what it, uh, types of, uh, you know, effort it takes to be successful in those career lines, some mm -hmm. things to think about and things to consider. So, you know, choosing a career is never easy, but as we talked about earlier, if you kind of let it be guided by where your interests and where your passions are at, you'll be much more successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's one thing to do research and explore with career services, but it's great to be able to hear from someone like you who's had more experience within the criminal justice system and um, learning about it. So we love that we have, um, we're able to pair working with career services with our faculty spotlights as well. Um, right, and I'll give you an example. A lot um, of people are interested in forensic investigations. Well, yeah. a lot of them don't realize that some of that also entails collection of evidence, and that could involve standing out there on the asphalt in 115 degree weather and collecting samples off the asphalt of evidence. Uh, or it might be being inside a house where the temperatures are 140 degrees and mm -hmm. you're taking photographs, uh, evidentiary photographs. It's mm -hmm. not all Hollywood forensics like it uh, is portrayed in TV. Some of the jobs involve some grimy, dirty, physically exhausting types of work, which uh, can surprise some people because they had a vision or a Hollywood version in their mind of what these jobs are like. You know, police shows on TV, you know, cops okay. just don't jump, shoot someone and then go back to lunch 10 minutes later. It just, it's not the reality of things. And so uh, I think it's important that, you know, students get a, the right perspective on what the criminal justice system jobs are and what they mm -hmm. entail. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that kind of concludes most of our questions for the interview. And now we just have one really silly, fun bonus question. So to participate, all you have to do is select a number from 1 to 50, and we'll just ask you a really silly question. Okay, 29. 29. <laughs> are you a cat person or a dog person? Oh, definitely a dog person, and I, I think cats are, are um, narcissists. They, they're pretty focused on themselves. <laughs> and so, I dogs are very social. Dogs, dogs, yeah. you know, will will forgive you. Dogs mm -hmm. will understand you better. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, even though I have neither right now, uh, my choice would be a dog because you can establish a better relationship with a dog than you can with yeah. a cat. Yeah, absolutely. Dogs just provide unconditional love all the time. And that's something that I appreciate. Right. 
All right. Well, All right. that concludes our interview. So thank you so much again for participating in our faculty spotlight. This is such a wonderful opportunity for students to take a peek into a field of interest and gain some very valuable knowledge from your personal experience. Um, so everybody watching, please be sure to check out our other faculty spotlights. Be safe, stay healthy, and go Thunderbirds.